me. Oh, we're on the internet. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi, internet. Uh, welcome to another uh, Bay Area Rust meetup. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, Y'all should come out to Mozilla sometime. We throw nice parties. Uh, but anyway, I am very pleased to uh, have our, our first distributed systems. Uh, this is a project that's, or a, this is a meetup that's very near and dear to my heart. So I'm very happy that we are finally getting the distributed people uh, talking. Uh, so anyway, uh, as always, thank you, Mozilla, for feeding us and giving us this lovely space. Uh, you guys are awesome, and thank you so much for, for making Rust and all this stuff. Lots of fun. So um, I don't have the next meetup organized just yet. I'm probably going to be leaning on, on Ream, so it's probably going to be web tech stuff, but I need to actually set a date. So you know, all you people who like web things, that it will be happening. Um, and finally, for our agenda, we have Yvonne, who is Andrew's uh, uh, advisor from Canada, all the way from Canada. Uh, we'll be speaking remotely. And then we have lots of other people. Uh, we have Diego and Andrew and Dan and Alex, and it's going to be an awesome meetup. Uh, we have a big lineup, so I'm going to end it here. So anyway, I'm going to hand it off to Yvonne, who is on the internet. So if you could share your screen and do your talk and everything. Thank you. Please give her a warm welcome. Wow, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. I know I'm violating every rule in the book to be remotely attending a meetup, but it's an incredible thrill for me. Uh, I think that um, Andrew uh, really wanted me <laughs> to talk about the past, and so I, I wanted to try to, you know, communicate that, uh, you know, it's it's a scary past in some ways. I mean, when I think about when I started working with distributed systems back in the mid '80s, and I was working on my master's degree, you know, that's now 30 years ago, and 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 he's really, I think, <laughs> wanting me to tell you a little bit about all the things that I thought were going to be really big that didn't turn out. <laughs> And I'm hoping that by virtue of sharing some of that kind of stuff, uh, 30 years from tonight, there'll be this huge party to remember what you guys were all doing there um, it, with this meetup and what's happening with Raft and what's happening with Rust and, and how you're not going to repeat the mistakes of uh, those that went before you. Um, I am up there in Victoria. I am very lucky to be a, a prophet UVic and I met Andrew when he was a student in the distributed systems course and basically told me that I better modernize my lectures. So we consider Victoria kind of the other rock, and here's an open invitation for everyone to come up and visit us if you're ever interested. Um, so I thought maybe what we could do is take a look at, you know, I love this, obviously, Leslie Lamport, and, uh, you know, this quote that I'm sure everybody's familiar with, but I just love it so much, this, you know, a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. And of course, you know, it's so funny being here using, you know, slides that are on the internet, having this broadcast on the internet, using this video stuff, uh, and, and being so overwhelmed with how great things have gone with distributed systems. But, you know, looking back, it's true. I want to be able to at least set the stage for what's coming here with Raft and consensus and how Rust is going to play into it all. And I think, you know, really help us build uh, distributed systems that we can count on. Um, certainly the story of Paxos and the way that Leslie Lamport uh, tells it on his web page about how it was submitted in 1990 but wasn't published until 98, it's, it's very funny if you haven't had a chance to read over um, sort of his description of the story. You know, it was, we're talking about distributed systems and we're in the 80s and, and he's thinking about consistency and he wants to make it fun and so he puts it into this context about this this ancient parliament and and he even does a few lectures i mean i just love this he does a few lectures kind of like this archaeologist uh, or anthropologist or you know sort of indiana jones kind of style and and he's talking about this system for consistency and uh, and the way that he puts it you know he said he asked some of the people who he had circulated the paper to 
And he asked him, he said, you know, so now that you've read the paper, what do you think about this question? You know, can you implement a distributed database that can tolerate the failure of any number of its processes, possibly all of them, without losing consistency and that will resume a normal behavior when more than half of the processes are again working properly? And, uh, and apparently a lot of people that read the paper actually said, gee, I don't know, that's a good question. And he was kind of like, well, that's what the paper was about. So certainly the story here is kind of about how, you know, um, consensus and certainly the problems of consistency uh, put in some of the older context and, and especially my my bad it was the way that you know I was looking at the uh, distributed course material and kind of dragging people through things that Andrew kind of grabbed me and said look we got to talk about raft and we got to talk about raft now and then uh, he started this project implementing raft in rust and and was very optimistic about how it's going to be really cool and certainly it's proven to be ultimately cool and giving me great hope in in what to expect for future systems and so i'm really i can't tell you how happy i am and excited i am to just do a couple minutes here for you guys about the 80s and why you are so amazing to me because certainly the 80s were pretty crazy times but we really did work hard on distributed systems and in particular developing languages for distributed systems. And um, maybe a lot of you obviously read a lot of Tannenbaum in your day and, and this uh, paper, this one's coming in at the end of the end of the 80s. And, and again, you know, maybe not one of the top of your reading list at this point, but um, looking at over a hundred different languages for distributed computing and, and trying to absolutely make it easier to understand distributed systems or the implementation of di distributed systems, really make the code look like the design, really capture the right abstractions. And of course, I put the dodo bird there just because, you know, we're, I'm just going to zoom you through some of these languages and the ways in which, you know, the focus was on parallelism and what are we going to do to try to make that clear with linguistic contact, con, constructs? Um, what about communication and how about constructs to help us wrap our minds around what we're going to do about partial failures. And again, the question maybe is, where are these languages now? And it's not that I'm saying that there wasn't great stuff. And obviously, a lot of things roll forward from the work that was done in the 80s. But I'm really loving what I'm seeing coming out of the REST community, and in particular with this challenge problem with Raft. I think uh, I was trying to uh, to capture some of the some of the time there from the hairstyle, anyway. But you know, uh, primitives for things like parallelism, communication, and partial failures were being, you know, broken up into finer grain issues. And you don't have to read this table and certainly you can take a look at the paper, but I just wanted to give you the sense of, you know, here's the kind of breakdown of the kinds of primitives we started to look at in these languages uh, over there on the left hand side. And then over on the right, you see, you know, all of the languages that we're trying to, to, to hit, the, hit the target with the right abstractions. And uh, again, obviously, a lot of these, maybe some of you have heard of some of them, but again, it's not like you're programming actively in a lot of these right now. Um, if we just zoomed in on communication and messages, you know, I just wanted to show you, gee, there was a whole set of languages and we were having a hard time letting go of Pascal. You can probably see that at this time. Um, you know, just looking at synchronous message passing, you know, and then if you didn't think that the primitives for synchronous message passing were, were going to be where it's at with distributed systems, maybe you want these ones over here. It's a whole other set of languages looking at asynchronous message passing. And again, a, a nice long list there and, and lots of great stuff going on. And it's not that it's all dead. It's just that when I think of Rust and I think of 30 years from tonight, I, I want to tell a different story. Well, probably not me, but you guys. Um, um, then, of course, there were other constructs to be able to make communication easier, and maybe this was the rendezvous and languages that were going to promote that kind of thing. And again, one more, the good old remote procedure call, you know, what's not to love about that? Other languages were making that part of the linguistic constructs that they were offering because we all knew that distributed systems were going to be, you know, the future. 
And last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, of course, there were those languages that had a little bit of everything. And yes, this is where I went. Certainly I used SR, that one down at the bottom there, it's called uh, Synchronizing Resources. And I was pretty sure that that was the bee's knees and it was offering everything we needed for distributed systems and that was it. Um, but of course there were others too, you know, uh, this was all about trying to make the code something that we could uh, modify, maintain, sustain, debug. Uh, so objects certainly, you know, work their way into the story. And of course, uh, things like transactions, atomic transactions, and maybe some people are certainly familiar with maybe Argus and, and some of the ideas there. So I just wanted to open tonight, first of all, by saying how wonderful I think you guys all are, and maybe to try to reflect a little bit because that's what you know, us old folks do upon maybe what some of the barriers to adoption might have been and why I think you're in a great position to actually avoid some of the, some of the things that may have taken some of these languages out. Um, you know, maybe it's timing. Maybe it was just far too early in the 80s. Maybe it was that a lot of these were coming out of ivory towers and the, they weren't in the hands of practitioners. Uh, maybe there was a lack of mechanical sympathy, you know, just being able to make those machines really do what we wanted to, because in some ways the abstractions that were being introduced were actually getting in the way. And it wasn't just that they were runtime overheads, it was really that, you know, we were still evolving and they weren't the right ones. Certainly when you are going down the path of adopting a new programming language and you're climbing the learning curve, it's a bummer when you hit the spot where all of a sudden there's no support for the things that you want to be doing. And so, you know, not a lot of standard libraries or certainly pack repos with packages. Some of the problems were being addressed, as you saw in some of the languages, while others weren't. And obviously that could be a problem, could make things error prone for the things that weren't being addressed. But here's where I think we're at tonight and why I'm just so excited. I mean, in the terms of killer apps, uh, consensus, which, you know, we don't need to think hard about what it really means anymore. And although it was great that Leslie Lamport tried to give us something entertaining, certainly if you're trying to organize dinner and a movie with friends that you're doing text messages and emails, to, <laughs> it's really hard to get consensus. We know what this problem is. Obviously, Diego's going to do a much better job than I am. But here's a big thing. It's about community. And what you have there is what we didn't have in the 80s. You know, you could have a great language that just wasn't being picked up and used and being being pulled apart and actually maybe, you know, that sense of people trying to build together um, what's needed when new things come up. So again, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to be handing over to Diego. I just had one last slide for you guys down there. Take on those challenge problems, march towards the beat of the drums. This is gonna be so great. I think a strong community really makes a difference. If there's any message I can give you from the 80s, that would be it. Thanks, Yvonne. So uh, I think, I mean, uh, well, I guess, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Um, if you do, there, there are microphones out in the audience. Um, you should use them, and you will hear. OK, if not, then we are on to Diego. All right. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, you guys. Thank you. Uh, are you going to stay up there? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, hey, so I'm going to talk about Raft and um, argue for why we need the Raft keyword in Rust. Um, like, you know, Yvonne was pointing out like there's all these different language constructs you could create, but as I screw it, let's just put Raft in the language. It'll be easy. <laughs> Um, so, a bit of history. Uh, Raft is a project that oh, I did. Can you stay near the microphone? Oops. Good point. <laughs> Sorry, Yvonne. Um, <laughs> Raft is a project that uh, I did for my PhD at Stanford. Um, after I graduated, I, well, at Stanford, I started a, a system in C called Log Cabin. And after I graduated, uh, 
that was still a research system, so I uh, worked with scale computing to get that uh, production ready. And they are deploying it to production now-ish. Um, and I, I just recently joined Salesforce, uh, where I'm starting to get involved in a bunch of infrastructure projects. Um, and with part of my time, I'll continue supporting the Raft community uh, in whatever way makes sense. So, let's see. Um, ho hopefully, Yvonne gave you a sense for what consensus is for. Um, I will be digging deeper and kind of giving you an introduction. Uh, but one of the things we did in Raft was say, look, this Paxos thing, it's super general, it's too general. Um, 90, I'll make up a number, 99% of the time what people want when they want consensus is actually uh, this thing called replicated state machines. So a typical consensus system is going to look like this. Um, some of them will stamp this out a thousand times over, but this is your basic building block. So I'm not allowed to leave the computer, huh? All right, all right, I can do this. That doesn't work either. I'll use a okay. mouse pointer. Nope. <laughs> Hello? Cool. Um, sorry, that side of the room. <laughs> so in a replicated state machine, uh, for the architecture, each server is going to have three different things on it. It'll have a consensus module, that would be an algorithm like Raft or Paxos, a copy of the replicated log, and a state machine. Um, what does that mean? Well, the state machine is the thing that you want to make fault tolerant. So here I'm just showing kind of a map from you know, x has the value 1, y has the value 2. Uh, I want that thing to be fault tolerant. And so this is what I want my clients to interact with. But uh, this whole replicated state machine is going to provide that illusion that, that they're only interacting with one uh, state um, So in, in this approach, the state machine just applies commands in order from the replicated log. So here's, they're all going to apply uh, set x to 3, then set y to 2, set x to 1, etc. The idea being, if all the state machines are deterministic and all the logs have the same series of commands, then all the state machines will end up in the same state and also produce the same outputs to send back the clients. So Raft is really in charge of uh, managing that replicated log and doesn't really care much about what the state machine is. In fact, the uh, Raft RS that you'll hear about next, um, it has a sample state machine that it ships with, but that's not part of that library. Uh, okay. Oh, and so like, why is this interesting from a programming language's perspective? Um, there's actually a lot of people who, when they go and they learn a first language, the first thing they do is build a replicated state machine. That's weird, right? Um, <laughs> but why? Like, it's got, it's got networking. It does a fair amount of that. It's got this log. This log has to be persistent. Um, so there's access to disk. There's performance considerations. like. It is a really good test for a systems programming language in user space. Um, I don't think anyone does this in kernel space. That'd be really odd. <laughs> so uh, as I said, Raft is an algorithm for implementing a replicated log. Um, the property that most of these consensus algorithms give you is that the system uh, will, at all costs, maintain consistency, and it'll make progress. It'll be available if any majority of the servers are up. So in a three-server cluster, as long as you have any two servers up, that system's fully operational. Um, it deals with fail stop failures, not Byzantine. So servers can crash, and they can restart. Messages can be slow, can be delayed, duplicated, and lost. Um, but they, 
you know, corruption, it's assumed that that, that would be detected. Uh, and servers are not supposed to lie to each other. Um, the, the big innovation, I guess, is that we designed REF for understandability specifically. And so uh, every time we had a design decision to make, we asked, you know, if there were two alternatives, we asked, well, which of these would be the easier one to explain to someone or the easier one for someone to understand? Um, so that led to a different breakdown of the problem than people were doing before. Um, so in Raft, there's a leader election, log replication, and safety. Um, so I'll talk about leader election in more depth. I don't want to take all the time for the meetups. So I won't do the other two today. Um, but in leader election, the idea is we want to select one of the servers to act as the cluster leader. And then uh, if that leader were to fail, we need to detect crashes and choose a new leader. You'll see Raft um, has a really strong form of leadership where the leader is the only one making changes to anything. So leader election is pretty exceptional. It happens uh, when you don't have a leader. In, in normal operation, we're, we're really all thinking about replicating the leader's log outwards. So um, as I showed in that figure, the, the leader takes commands from the clients and appends it to its copy of the log. And then it's just trying to get the other logs to look like its own. Um, so it replicates its log out to other servers and overwrites any inconsistencies just blindly. Uh, the third section, safety, kind of ties these two together. So we can't have the leader blindly overwriting others' logs if the leader's log is no good. Um, safety, in, in the safety section, we kind of rig leader election, make sure that our leader has an up-to-date log so that um, you know, we don't lose any important entries. I know, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to use this visualization to talk about leader election. It's a little more fun than slides. Uh, hey. Focus helps. Um, so, here you'll watch a leader election happen pretty quickly. Uh, it's server two that's going to time out start an election, and become leader. Oh, that's our leader. It's sending heartbeats, getting responses back. And I've paused it now. Um, that was a little quick, huh? But that's, that's what leader election, uh, that's what a normal leader election looks like in Raft. So it's a, about a 200 millisecond timeout, and then uh, a round of requests. I'll, I'll go through it more slowly now. Um, so the next thing that's going to happen is I'm going to kill off server two, and then uh, we'll wait for another timeout period and watch another election go by more slowly. So I killed off server two, who's the leader in term two. Um, this server three is about to time out. So it timed out, and it switched to term three. The, the term's just this increasing number that kind of keeps track of time. So, you know, we'll have a leader for term two, then we'll have a leader for term three. Might be the same one, might be a different server, um, et cetera, et cetera. Helps to distinguish new information from old information. Uh, so this server three here has moved on to term three, and it's entered the candidate state where it tries to collect votes from a majority of the servers in the cluster. Uh, that's what those little dots are shown uh, within the server. So it, yeah, it already voted for itself. Um, when you become a candidate, you just grant yourself the vote. And these messages are, are called request vote RPCs. So all of the communication is uh, request and then a response back. So server three is it's informing everyone else, like, hey, I've moved on to term three. You should, too. And also, can I have your vote? Okay. 
So all those servers move on to term three. Um, server will just be on the latest term it's ever heard of. And uh, by the way, once you move to term three, you no longer will take commands from a term two leader or a term one leader. Uh, for, for, for now, um, the servers just grant their votes first come, first serve. Uh, that's the thing that we mess with in the safety section that I won't be talking about later. And then, uh, you know, the votes are kind of grayed in on server three, like it's gotten them, but it doesn't know it yet. Once it hears back from a majority of servers and gets a majority of votes, it becomes leader, and those are just heartbeats that it's sending out. Cool. So that was good case leader election. Let me show you bad case leader election, uh, what we call a split vote. So here, um, servers one and five on the top left are gonna happen to time out at the exact same time. They become candidates in term four. They vote for themselves. They request votes from the others. And it just so happens that they each get one more vote. Um, server two is still down, so it can't reply. So server one, one has two votes, server five has two votes. That's not a majority of five, so they, they're still in that candidate state. They haven't won yet. They're trying to talk to server two. They can't because it's down. Oh no, what do we do? Um, yes. Did you know that before? Well, that's cheating. <laughs> um, so we thought about this, uh, you know, me going into my advisor weekly, hour-long, one-on-ones, like, what are we going to do about this? We could do, you know, if we, clearly if we had these two communicate, they could, they could go and exchange votes with each other, and we know that one of them ought to win. Um, but we finally decided, like, the easiest thing to do is to just wait for another timeout, um, because... You know, that's, that's already behavior we understand. It's waiting for a timeout and going through a new election. Um, so all, all of these timeouts are actually randomized. Um, they, anytime you hear from a leader or you grant your vote, you reset your timeout to somewhere between halfway and all the way around the circle. And so if that random range is big enough, it makes it extremely likely for one server to wake up first and collect votes first. So most likely, this gets resolved uh, in the very next term. Server three times out. It's quick enough. It becomes leader in term five. Um, so in practice, I did a bunch of evaluation. My conclusion in practice is you want that random range to be about 10 times your round trip time. If you've got that, then uh, split votes will be pretty rare, and, and they get resolved pretty quickly. Uh -oh. Sorry. All right. So just to review leader election, um, we use heartbeats and timeouts to detect crashes. So the leader's send, sending heartbeats periodically, the other servers are timing out uh, randomly. The timeouts are randomized to avoid split votes and to resolve the split votes. And then that, that they need a majority of votes be, to become leader in a particular term, and servers may only vote once per leader, guarantees that we're only gonna have one leader per term the, the whole rest of the algorithm uh, really deeply depends on this property. Um, if you didn't have that, it, it'd be hard to get anything else right. So hopefully that gives you kind of a flavor um, of Raft. And I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about the log cabin implementation. Um, so this was, I guess, technically the first Raft implementation um, 
although it, you know, I was trying to write the paper and write the thesis at the same time. Some of the other ones uh, may have been feature complete before me. Um, it, uh, so it's a, un unlike RAFT-RS, which is a library, this provides a network service. Um, so you can execute RPCs against it. It offers kind of this key value store interface that looks like a file system. So, so you can, there's directories and files within that. So you can organize your data. Um, unfortunately, when I started this project, Rust was pre-0.1. Um, so it's, it's come a long way since then. Uh, I wish it was in Rust, but it is in GCC 4.4's version of C++ OX, now known as C++ 11, but that string is not recognized by the compiler. <laughs> um, so I will, I have one positive slide about C++ and then two negative ones. <laughs> Um, I, I guess one positive thing is, um, you know, if like what, why might you use Log Cabin today? Well, if if you are a C plus plus shop like Scale Computing, uh, then it you know it may integrate more nicely into your code. Um, it's not really as feature rich as some of the other Raft implementations now. So, okay. Good things to say about C++. I promise the list is a little longer than two bullets. Um, it is fast, right? It, and it's, uh, it's predictably fast. Like you don't pay for what you don't use and you can kind of guess, like I know how long a function call is going to take. I know how long, you know, within a few milliseconds, I know how long every operation in the language will take. Um, there's not a runtime, so there's no GC pauses, so uh, it's quite predictable. Um, I was pushing raft timeouts down. I think I had them at six to twelve milliseconds on a on a gigabit network, and things were actually stable, um, which you probably can't say for many higher level languages. Um, you can get pretty nasty, go low level with the systems uh, aspects of it. Of it. So uh, one thing I didn't talk about with Raft is um, that that log can't grow forever. Eventually you have to uh, delete some entries from it. And so log cabin uses snapshotting where it needs a consistent view of its state machine for an extended period of time. Uh, well, since this was C++, I just called fork and the child process gets this copy on write uh, consistent view of the whole address space automatically thanks to the OS. That's something you can't really do in a high level language. And it saved time. Um, I'll give, give some credit to uh, C++ OX or 11, whatever you want to call it, um, where this, uh, the unique pointer, you know, the move semantics it introduces, it makes uh, it makes memory leaks pretty hard to do, um, so it's it's not really am I pairing all my news with deletes like most of that is handled by the uh, by the language by the libraries. Good, um, of course, Rust has all of this too. Um, you know, it has unique pointer built into the language. It has a whole bunch of other nice features. Um, but this is all good. <laughs> okay. Good and bad. Um, log cabin is pretty much self-contained. It, it doesn't have many dependencies other than uh, protobuf when it comes to serializing data and gtest for unit testing. So that means it. You know, it has its own event loop based on ePoll. It has its own RPC system. It has its own pretty much everything. Um, that is, it's nice in some ways, right? It's uh, few dependencies, few libraries can bite you by changing. Pretty easy to debug. Uh, if you find a function call, you can find the source code really easily. 
on the same style, all thoroughly tested. And I'd say I learned a lot by doing this. Um, but, you know, that was in a university setting. It may not be the most practical way to write software. So why? Well, it's hard to depend on libraries in C++ for a number of reasons. Um, there's no standard packaging system. There's no standard build system. There's no uh, package ecosystem, really. Like Some people depend on Boost, and that does a few things for you. But it's not batteries included. Um, libraries you do find, or code you do find, all uses different subsets of C++. At log cabins in C++ OX as of GCC 4.4. It uses exceptions. It does not use lambdas. Those aren't until 4.6. <laughs> um, if you know, if you want to depend on a library, that library uses exceptions. Your code doesn't. That's a problem, etc. Um, there's some some libraries go really heavy on shared pointer. Uh, unfortunately, it could be boost shared pointer. It could be standard shared pointer. But so there's a, a reference counted pointer. Um, and if, if a library is doing that and you didn't want to use reference counting, it, it can spread kind of virally. So it's, it's hard. Um, I, I imagine that's a problem that Rust has today, where if you are developing a library, uh, you should think about whether you're forcing your users to be uh, in this reference counted world or not. Um, thread safety. Uh, of course, is <laughs> it's not enforced by the language. It's in the document. No, it's there's no documentation. <laughs> um, that one's hard. Uh, so if you're if you're using a library like uh, Log Cabin didn't always use ePull directly. It used, used to rely on libevent too. Um, that was a mess when it came to thread safety, right? Uh, it uses EPO now because at least like Linux is clear on what the guarantees are. Um, so all of these things also mean that it's hard, as much as I want to, it is hard to extract Log Cabin's Raft implementation from Log Cabin, the network service, um, because what packaging system am I going to use? What API will I export? Uh, do I have to worry about ABI compatibility? Blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's, uh, it's just easier to package this thing up in a way where it sits across the network and you get a very small client library to talk to it. Um, I think REST is a huge improvement on all of this stuff. Uh, the cargo for packaging means uh, you know, I don't really have to deal with build systems much when I pull in a library. Crates.io means I can find libraries. They exist. They're out there. <laughs> they're, they're even in a standard place. And the rich, rich type system means that um, these thread safety issues, uh, they are going to bite me at compile time, not run time. So if I'm doing something wrong, I will find out about it quickly. More on thread safety, because <laughs> this stuff's hard. Um, you know, in my experience, uh, these bugs are rare, but when they happen, they're they're pretty hard to debug. So, log cabin uses a monitor style, and I uh, I'm sure we'll put the slides up. I have a link to the paper that introduced that. Uh, that's an old paper. Yvonne will be excited. <laughs> um, but but that basically means uh, there's one mutex per object for the objects that are monitors. And all public methods hold that mutex the whole time you're in the method, unless they're blocked on a condition variable. So you know that uh, you know this is a synchronization thing, and, uh, and you don't have to worry much as a caller. It's, it's a good strategy, but there's no language support for it. And so it's a lot. Um, I, I guess it's just really hard to enforce it. Let me, let me give you an example of a bug, a uh, real bug, that would cause an hour-long hang 
on shutdown sometimes. So this is uh, the main function for a thread. Um, says while not exiting, grab the lock, do some stuff, lock on a condition variable. Um, whoops, I must have refactored this code or something and accidentally I'm accessing that exiting variable without the lock. It's just a Boolean, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> That one, I mean, it's easy to spot on the slide. It was not so easy at the time. Uh, in, in Rust, the, in the equivalent Rust code, exiting wouldn't even be in scope. So this would have been a compiler. Um, that would have been pretty nice. OK, to wrap up, let some people speak that have some more Rust experience. Um, we designed Raft for understandability. Um, so that hopefully it's easier for people to learn. I talked about the randomized leader election approach, which we think is a simple way to solve a whole bunch of problems. Um, you can find some videos on the Raft website where I go through the uh, log replication safety aspects of Raft. Um, and then if you want a whole lot more info, there's uh, the Raft paper. We tried really hard to make this readable. Um, and I wrote a 255-page book. Um, <laughs> talks about how, how do you change the members of the cluster. So if you want to get a three, from a three-server cluster up to a five-server cluster, you're changing the definition of a majority. Um, that has to go through the consensus algorithm. Uh, talks about different approaches to compacting the log, uh, how clients interact with the system, and a lot of evaluation. Um, so in the, in the log cabin implementation, I'd say C++ was a mixed bag. Um, the performance is awesome. The, uh, you know, the, the ecosystem that it lives in, it's pretty siloed. So, uh, and you know, log cabin didn't, it is self-contained in that. Uh, the, the memory and thread safety bugs. Um, while I think we're past most of them, they can be annoying. Uh, and I guess in terms of Rust, I'm, I'm really excited to see it, you know, it's it 1.0 is a language that's getting quite stable. I think there's more work to do on the libraries, um, but I want to see distributed systems help push those forward. Uh, and Raft RS, of course, I'm excited to see that turn into a production-ready implementation that we know for sure has no memory bugs. <laughs> oh, uh, I should say there's a, a pretty active mailing list if you have questions, and I have Raft stickers. <laughs> Yay. This is going to be funny. Um, you mentioned no lib event. Uh, I'm going to use ePoll directly. Uh, Rust has something called uh, MIO. It's got other stuff built on top of MIO. Um, how do we not put people in that position? So have you looked at MIO? Is there something that'd be in there? Is there a high level thing? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so I can use this one. A um, couple of things you definitely need to do. Well, the thread safety, I think, will be free. <laughs> Uh, and that MIO's, you know, Rust level interface will describe how to use it correctly. Because um, ultimately, like, e even if you have an event-based network system, uh, you're, you may or may not have a thread-based rest of your system, right? It, it was very hard in log cabin to communicate between those two aspects. The other thing is... Um, you know, I went back to ePoll because ePoll has man pages, and man pages are thorough. <laughs> uh, so just have good documentation, good examples, and cool. yeah. well, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Andrew, you're up, wherever you are. Oh, there you are. This thing? I was hiding. 
that thing, but I think you have to hit down from time to time in here. So, I don't know. Oh, who wants Flash? Jeez. Okay. So I'm going to talk about Raft RS. It's our maturing. Oh, it's our maturing Raft implementation. It's not ready yet, but you can definitely play with it, and we really want you to contribute to it. Um, there's no CLAs. It's MIT. It's all community guided, and we really want to be your first distributed system. So if you're a virgin, come on, join us. <laughs> um, and ask your questions during the talk if you want, because I don't like talking for 15 minutes straight. Uh, we have lots of friends, especially the IRC channel. It's the friendliest IRC channel I've ever been on. So let's take a quick big picture look. Um, some libraries that we use and a little bit of history. Uh, so a little bit of history. Uh, I started working on it in Avon's distributed systems class in 0 0.9 nightlies. So pretty much half my week of working on it was fixing the things that happened last week. <laughs> So I learned very quickly to update on Friday night and then work on it all Saturday, Sunday. Um, and crates really weren't around then, so it was mostly the standard library. I think I had one or two dependencies, and I think one of those was Rust C serialized, which was almost in the standard lib. Um, after a few finals, we finally kind of got back to working on it, and people started coding with me, like Dan, who you'll meet later. Um, and we had a few other contributors. That was really cool as someone who was just kind of getting into writing open source software and actually making libraries instead of little executables that a couple of people would download and run. Um, so we took a lot of time to think about how we were going to make this one because we actually want people to use it, not just look at it and be like, oh. <laughs> so we want it to be fast. We don't want it to have an opinion about how you write your code or how you architect your system. We want it to fit into how you want it to work. Uh, and we really want it to be correct to Diego's paper. Um, we noticed that a lot of the Raft implementations online and on the Raft website were just key value stores. Um, and we don't want to lock you into anything, so we've made some choices that will hopefully later enable things like Python to start calling into our code, or C or something. Uh, so we picked to use Mio and Captain Proto. We have a Captain Proto guy here. Uh, it's pretty cool. If you want to learn more about it, talk to him. Uh, we actually had to fork it, though, because it didn't have good async support at the time. That's getting better, though, and that's an ongoing story, and we really like Captain Brodo. Um, and Mio was a cool pairing with it, because Mio's really low level, and it was much, much funner than Node to play with, because you actually got to play with the system and not have to deal with callbacks, because callback hell is hell. Um, I really like tooling. That's a big thing for me. So I. Did a lot of work on making sure that we have automated testing, making sure we have documentation that's always up to date. Um, Huan actually took one of my blog posts and made it an awesome little application, which is great. You should use it if you're not. Um, and we're, we started using Homu, which is Boars. And if you've contributed to Rust, you know what Boars is. He keeps master, it keeps master green, and it makes sure that someone always reviews your code, even if that's you. But generally, we don't do that. Uh, so it's a pretty simple diagram, uh, just like you saw Diego do. Uh, so you have a program, and then we're going to ask you to pick a state machine and a persistent log, and then we provide everything else. So your code will have an implementation of the state machine, or if you decide to, you might steal someone else's, and you'll choose a log from either ones that we make or make your own. And hopefully you'll give it back to us when you make your own, right? Um, and the, your program will talk to the client, which talks to the server, which talks to other servers, which all talk to their consensus modules, and blah, blah, blah. So we've built the client, which has a really nice, easy API. You just spawn a client. You tell it the nodes in the cluster. Um, it doesn't have to be in the cluster, so your client could be anywhere. Uh, and you can get immutable or immutable access. Uh, so you're probably wondering, what, what are these messages? Like, what am I passing around, right? You can pick whatever you want. 
you give us some bytes and we ship them off to the, the state machine. Your state machine that you implement knows how to handle those bytes. And that could be Captain Proto buffers, it could be Serde, it could be bin code, we don't care. You do whatever you want. Um, and then you get a response back. These calls are blocking, which is was a little bit weird after working in Mio. <laughs> uh, the server is a big Mio reactor that your clients talk to. Uh, you're never gonna touch this other than to run it. And running it is you go to an ID, the address, and your implementations. And don't use unwrap in production. <laughs> There's no raft specific logic in the server implementation. All it is is message handling and acting on what we get back from the consensus module. So this was done so that we could test the consensus module um, because we really want to have really robust testing. Uh, the consensus module you will never touch unless you're contributing, which you should. Uh, it's pretty fun. Most of the calls look a little bit weird because we don't actually return anything. What you do is when we pass it in, we pass in this action structure, and then that comes back out of the function call. And that way we can react on it in the server in different ways. Um, there's no IO, there's no nothing. So it's really kind of safe and one. <laughs> Uh, so what do you have to do to use this library? Um, first you need to pick a log, and as Diego told us about the log, it's persistent and it's replicated. The log entries are in order, and anything that's out of order or looks weird is overwritten by the leader. So log implementations could be things like files, write ahead logs, um, I expect someone will eventually do one in a database. Uh, if you wanna start playing with writing a log, uh, Dan Berger started to work on a write-ahead log. It's been a bit of a yak shave. I think he might actually talk about it. Uh, but that would be a fun project. And we're hoping to improve the API, which you'll see here. And it's basically just a bunch of really simple calls that return results. So you could go and implement all these and you have a log. Uh, the state machine is what you'll most likely be implementing yourself. And we don't have too many demos of this, so if you make a good demo, definitely share it back. Um, this is where you'll handle those bytes that you send from the client. So you can define whatever. Uh, we have examples with get, put, and compare, and swap. Someone was talking to me earlier about watch, so that you could watch something. You could totally put all of this in here. Um, the watch might be a little bit hard because you'll actually have to have network calls and stuff. That might be interesting. Um, it, is also responsible for contributing log, comp log compaction, which we don't have yet. Uh, it's in process, and I don't think we're gonna fork uh, like Diego did, but I don't know, that might be the best choice. And again, this API is not set in stone. It's pretty simple. You can apply, which gives you mutable access, so that's where we do things like puts. Uh, and these all go through the consensus module and the logs, so they're all auditable. You can see where they are. Uh, the query is read-only, so it doesn't go through the log. It's very fast to get a response back. Uh, so you should only be using apply when you actually need mutable access, because it's gonna take a lot longer to go through. And then we have snapshot and restore snapshot, which aren't implemented yet. So maybe one of you can help us with that, or we'll work on it. Um, we built Raft because we want to build things together with you. So we're working on getting to 1.0. We have a few things on the go. Uh, membership changes, log compaction, snapshotting. The things in Diego's paper that we haven't done yet need to be done before we can hit 1.0. That's, that's the law. Um, and we really want to improve some robustness in the client and in the server. We want to make sure that we don't have any crashes that might happen and surprise you because Rust is supposed to be crash-free, right? <laughs> um, in the future, some cool projects would be C bindings, because we don't really have a huge runtime or anything, so that shouldn't be a huge difficulty. Um, new libraries are emerging with Mio and things. Else. Is it MIO or Mio? I think it's MIO. <laughs> new libraries are emerging that uh, use that. Um, Drew 
David Renshaw has a new library called GJ that looks very interesting. So we might have to end up refactoring somehow with these new libraries, but I think we're just kind of waiting because until we get to 1.0, there's no reason to refactor everything yet. And failure testing, which is where you come in, because when you try and implement it and it crashes, you can tell us. And we can build a test to fix it. Um, so get involved. Come over to our GitHub repo. It's not hard to find. Just look for Hoververse GitHub and you'll find it. Um, break it. Improve it. Yell at us. That's OK. Just be nice. Um, and join us on IRC. We're on the Raft IRC channel. We're all very friendly people. Um, and we won't bite. <laughs> I was going to do a demo, but I don't have my computer. So <laughs> maybe, maybe you can demo it yourself, because it's not that hard to demo. If you want to play with a demo, you can just clone the repo. And there's an experiments folder. It has uh, an automated playbook to deploy a built Raft cluster uh, over Ansible. And we have like a tmux dashboard that you can play with some simple like macro commands. Just to play with the algorithm, you can shut down nodes with Control c It's nice and easy. And yeah, have fun with it. Thanks. <laughs> Is there any questions? Uh, so I noticed on the first page uh, you mentioned that you're still on the, that you're still on nightlies. Uh, what library features are you blocking on to get into stable land? Um, for nightlies, I don't know what's blocking the nightlies anymore because I can't. I've never used stable. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on nightlies since zero point nine, and I when when I can, I'll move to stable. I think it was a dependency. I think it was maybe Mio at one point. I don't know. <laughs> That'd be good to know. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, membership, uh, cluster membership changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, the members of a cluster are one of the things that you pass in to uh, create a new client. Right, so that's probably going to be a need to change in the API. Um, so membership changes, we've built in some of the hooks needed to kind of work on that. And it's definitely something we've thought of as we programmed it. We just haven't got around to it yet. Thank you. It would be a fun project, though. Uh, we've got issues up with breakdowns on membership changes and log compaction on our GitHub issues page that has things you need to check off to have it done. And we'll definitely help anyone who wants to help out. OK, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, one over? Yeah. How do I go back to full screen? Go. OK. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Burkert. Uh, I have been using Rust about a year now, um, back when it was, I think I first got in it when, like, the week after the tilde was removed, or one of the sigils. I don't remember which it was. Um, so if, if you're an old timer, you might remember that. Um, so I, as Andrew was saying, I've been, I've been contributing a lot to the, to the Raft implementation, and so uh, I'm here today just to kind of give an experience report uh, about what it's like to write distributed systems in Rust. And the goal here is to kind of get a groundswell and get people moving on on uh, projects and uh, tools and, and uh, APIs and documentation, everything needed to make writing distributed systems in Rust better. Uh, so I'll be talking about why you would want to do that, why Rust is a good programming language for it, some of the things that it's not yet good at, uh, mostly around libraries. Uh, and um, yeah, so that's where we're headed. Um, I'm DCB on IRC. I'm Dan Burker on GitHub, so you can find me there. Um, yeah. Ooh. Okay. 
Uh, so distributed systems, it's a big topic, right? There's no way we're going to cover it all tonight in the 10 minutes I have. Um, I've kind of bolded the, the topics I do want to cover. Um, not that security encryption and performance and all the other things aren't important. Um, but in the case of security encryption, I think I'm not the person to be talking about that. And in any case, uh, we've already had Rust, whole Rust meetups on that, and, and you don't want me talking about that. Um, performance, the story with distributed systems is performance is good. Um, it's the same for writing a browser or for doing anything in a systems language, right? And there's nothing really specific to distributed systems um, performance-wise you know, if you make your language faster for writing systems programs, it will benefit distributed systems. Um, but I will be talking about I.O. and networking because those are so intrinsically um, intertwined with distributed systems. And I'll be talking about operations, kind of like ops things. Um, and I'm going to be talking about this because it's something that I haven't seen a lot of, of people talking about yet in Rust. And I think it's coming. It's a matter of time. Um, but nobody's talking about it yet. So networking in Rust today, you have kind of two options if you want to do networking. You have um, the stood net package, which is a really nicely designed blocking thread-based um, uh, library. And this, this code block on the left here is taken directly from the standard documentation. Um, you know, it's, if you know a little bit of Rust, it's pretty easy to follow. Uh, we have kind of an iterator of uh, TCP sockets coming in from a listener. So listener.incoming, and you get uh, an iterator of streams. Uh, you open up the stream, the TCP socket, you give it to a thread, and the thread handles it, right? Looks, looks pretty nice, uh, pretty good. You spawn up uh, a new thread per socket, and everything's good. This will be very fast uh, and scale pretty well to a lot of threads. Um, I don't have hard numbers, but it's like, you know, you can do thousands of connections with a model like this um, on, you know, a reasonably hefty machine with, uh, with a modern Linux. Um, on the other side here, we have a code snippet from Mayo. Um, Mayo is a library to do non-blocking uh, evented IO in Rust. And the code block on the right is not at all comparable to the one on the left. It's doing far less, and it's um, far more complicated. Uh, and that's just kind of the state of the world with Mayo. And, and that's actually going to be a lot of this talk is, is um, I know a lot of people are interested in trying out Mayo. Um, a lot of the challenges in, that we've had to face in Raft have not actually been Raft or distributed challenges. It's been how the heck do we get this library and this library to talk to each other and do this in, a, in an efficient way. Um, early on in Raft, we decided to go with Mayo and non-blocking evented IO. Um, and I don't know that we had a great reason. It was kind of the shiny new thing on the block. It seemed really cool. Um, let's go for it. Um, but you know, as Diego said, he uses ePoll too, so there's some justification there. Um, the whole, so non-blocking sockets invert your program flow, um, and it's it's an entirely new way of thinking. Whereas before, when you try and read from a socket, um, you will always get back the data. It just might be in an indeterminate amount of time, but you never see that time in the thread. It's, the thread just goes to sleep magically, and another thread wakes up and takes over. Um, with non-blocking I.O., you have to handle the case where no, there's no data from that socket to be read, go do something else for a while, and then come back and read it and try and read again. Um, and so that's the whole trick. You can have a set of 10 or 100 or 10,000 sockets, and as long as you're trying to read from each um, and, and they're not blocking the thread, that's fine. Um, which kind of begs the question, how do you know when to read from a socket, right? Um, if it doesn't block and it just gives you back an error that says, no, I don't have any data, well, you can't just go down the list and ask them all over again. Um, and so the operating system gives you some tools around this. And, and Mayo is basically a wrapper around these operating system tools that tell you, hey, go look at this socket now. It's got some data for you. Um, so the tools themselves are, are ePoll. Um, KQ on BSDs and, and OSX, and uh, the Windows story is actually improving. Uh, as of yesterday or last night, there was a big Windows patch that landed for Mayo, so I, I haven't tried it out, but word on the street is, it, is it, it's working. Um, so let's build something, right? Let's, uh, let's look at these APIs and kind of just uh, dissect them. Um, 
we're not going to start with something as, as complicated as Raft. What we're going to do is we're going to build a simple key value store, um, something you know very, very simple. So little telnet sesh, situation or uh, session, put my key in some value, and the server sends back OK. Uh, get my key, and it sends back the value that I just put. Get another key, no value. Uh, bogus command sends back error. Um, telnet doesn't actually have the arrows, but I put that in to show what I'm sending and then the other stuff's what we're getting back. Uh, if you are following along at home or have a laptop out, uh, go to github.com, Dan Burkert, Simple KV, uh, and server.rs has all the code uh, that we'll be taking a look at here. Uh, so a simple key value store is nothing more than a map, right? So we have a, our struct. Uh, at this bottom line, we basically have a string string hash map uh, that's storing all our key values. And that's pretty much it, right? That's your database. Um, that's your in-memory database. Um, we have a TCP listener. Uh, this particular TCP listener is a, is a Myo branded TCP listener as opposed to the one we saw earlier, which was a std net. Um, and I'll talk about how that's a little bit different, although it looks very similar. And we have a slab of connections. And a slab is essentially just uh, a bag. Um, and it's just a container for con connections. And you can uh, ask the, the container for a specific connection given a token, which is kind of a key. So Myo is evented. It gives you an event loop abstraction. And this is way too small to read. Um, and if you could read it, I'm not sure it would make any sense to you unless you had uh, quite a bit of Myo experience already. But basically, what's happening here is that um, we implement an interface for our server type. So our server type is this struct. We implement a trait interface for this uh, server type that has a function called ready. And the Myo event loop will call ready on our handler uh, the trait is called handler that we're implementing. Uh, it will call ready on our on our implementation with the token and the event set for a specific socket that you've registered. So for instance, uh, our key value store is just sitting there waiting for uh, connections to open to it, for clients to connect, and then it waits for bytes to come in that it can read from that socket. Uh, it parses the bytes, figures out whether it's a get or a put, does the operation, and then sends back the, the response. So in the very beginning, all you have is a TCP listener. And you register it with this event loop and say, I want readable events for my uh, TCP listener. And a readable event for a listener corresponds to a new, a new uh, socket connection. Um, ready will get called with the token corresponding to that TCP listener, as well as uh, an event set and the event set is basically just a bit mask that tells you uh, it's, it's either readable or writable or uh, interrupt or something like that. Um, and the story for, for normal sockets is very much the same. So you register it with the event loop. And down here, you can see what that register call looks like. So we look up the connection out of the connections, which is the, the collection of connections. We register it with the token. Or sorry, we register the socket from that connection, the token, uh, the events we're interested in, as well as some polling options, which uh, if you're interested in, definitely check out the Mayo documentation or uh, Carl Arch had a great talk at the Rust uh, camp um, day a couple of weeks ago that's online. Um, one of the biggest things you have to deal with when using non-blocking I.O. as opposed to blocking I.O. is buffer management. Uh, when you're reading from a socket that's going to block, you, you have an implicit buffer there that's kind of on the stack frame. Uh, and when you move to, an, a non, to a, basically an invented model, you have to make that buffer explicit. And so with every single connection now, we are going to add a read buffer and a write buffer. And so when we read bytes from the connection, we're going to read into the read buffer. Uh, and when we write bytes out, instead of writing directly to the socket, we'll serialize to the write buffer, register an interest in writing to that socket, asynchronously later be notified by the event loop, and then only then will we copy the bytes from the write buffer onto the socket. Um, 
pretty complicated, way more complicated than just saying read or write, right? Um, the reason you have to read, so the write buffer is pretty obvious why you need it. Well, it's the write buffer is a little more clear. You need a write buffer because when you decide to write is not when you get to write. You only get to write when you're notified that you can write. So you have to have somewhere to, to store that message. Um, the read buffer is a little bit more subtle. Typically, or always in a distributed system, you have some kind of protocol that you're conforming to, whether it's HTTP or Cap'n Proto RPC or SOAP or XML or whatever. You have some protocol um, that you're trying to do. And typically, if you only have received half your message, that's not great from a protocol standpoint. You pretty much have to wait for the entire message to arrive before you can do anything with it. And that's not a guarantee that a stream that a stream abstraction like TCP will give you. It's very possible that you'll get um, 10 bytes out of a 20 byte message, for instance. And so the read buffer comes into play there. You have to have somewhere to store those intermediate bytes before you attempt to deserialize it. Um, so that gets to the next point. How do you deserialize? This is again quite small, but if all you can do is read the the comment, that's I'll explain it. Uh, you don't really need to be able to read the code here. This is this what this code is doing is looking at the read buffer for a connection, scanning over it for new line symbols. Um, remember, our protocol that we're implementing here is a line based get key put key value. It's very simple. So it scans over the read buffer for a new line, takes that slice of the bytes, and then turns it into either a get or a read. Um, pretty simple, right? We're just scanning through input for new lines. The standard library, of course, has uh, something that can do this off of uh, the standard uh, file and uh, network abstractions. But those things don't work very well with uh, non-blocking sockets because uh, if if you're reading through, if you're reading bytes from that socket, and all of a sudden it returns an error, I don't have any bytes I would block, so I'm giving you back an error instead of bytes. Uh, the standard types will basically just throw that data on the floor. Uh, instead of giving you back the error and the things you've already read. So if your line is 100 bytes long and your socket only has 50 bytes received, you read out of it, you have 50 bytes and an error. Well, it just throws those on the floor and gives you back the error. And so that that's not, obviously, uh, that won't work. So we have to implement our own logic to do all this deserialization. This code um, is... You know, it's not very long. It's only about 20 lines, but it's pretty nasty. And there were a few bugs in it uh, when I wrote it. And I'm not claiming that it's bug free now, but it was hard code to write. And this is only code that deserializes a line based protocol, right? As about as simple as it gets. So protocols and serialization can get significantly harder uh, when you're dealing with low level abstractions like this. Uh, this is this is the message type. Um, it, it this is actually this would be the same in a non-blocking or a blocking uh, situation. But basically, this is taking uh, the byte, the lines of a uh, the bytes of a line, turning it into a, either a get, a put, or an error, uh, depending on what it is. <clears throat> so, given that it's so much harder to to do this, at least with the abstractions that Mayo provides. Um, why do we use non-blocking I.O.? Or why are people interested in it? And the, the primary thing is scalability. So if you have a server that you want to scale to hundreds of thousands of connections, um, it's not possible or uh, it's not great to have to spin up a thread per one of those. Uh, there's overheads associated with threads that are can be more than, uh, than with the non block so there's overhead associated with non-blocking connections, right? We had to we had to um, to give that explicit buffer in this case. Sometimes you can get around that, but usually you'll have to have something like that. But the the overheads with threads can be even greater, including scheduling overhead. Um, one of the interesting things about using Mayo that we've discovered with Raft is that because it's explicitly single-threaded, we don't have to have any uh, synchronization on access to what otherwise would be shared state. So uh, for instance, the, if you can imagine the consensus module um, is if, you, if we were spinning up a thread per connection, all those connections are trying to access that consensus module 
uh, concurrently. And so we would have to put some kind of synchronization on that consensus module. But because we're using Mayo and it's single threaded, uh, we actually don't have to use any type of synchronization, which is interesting. Um, I'm not willing to say that it's, uh, it's all, all these things are very, very intricate with whether that's a performance win or not, but it's at least uh, we know there's no thread safety bugs there, um, which Rust kind of gives you already. But um, So the way forward, I think for, I think everyone kind of who's studied this understands this, the way forward for non-blocking IO is that we need better abstractions. And this is kind of a call to arms for the community. Uh, there's already people working on this, um, really smart people who have done way more network programming than me, so I'm not like trying to um, say anyone's doing anything wrong. I just think um, more attention is always good and more and getting people kind of rallied behind something would be good. Um, of course, there's no right answer. There's different abstractions. There's futures. There's futures and streams. There's coroutines. There's callbacks. There's the event loop, uh, which you could claim is, is an abstraction in of itself. Um, and what is the right choice is probably, you know, there's no right answer for all applications or all libraries. Um, but it's definitely important to keep in mind that an async abstraction has very far reaching consequences. Um, Diego was talking a little bit about how if you use reference counted po smart pointers in, in C++, they tend to be viral and take over your code base. Co uh, async abstractions are very much the same thing. So if you've ever used Netty or something in, on the JVM like that, all of a sudden, every single function call you have has a Netty future type in its uh, method uh, signature. So these things, you know, um, there's a lot of thought that needs to be, and design that needs to be put into these things. It's, uh, it's relatively simple to go out and design a future abstraction and hook it up to ePoll or whatever, but making sure that all the libraries in the ecosystem fit together with that is the challenge. Uh, and, and I think we need to be thinking about that. Um, I did not call out any specific projects on here uh, specifically, but there are, there are quite, there's multiple implementations of futures and streams hooked up to, to IO. Uh, there's even multiple coroutine implementations, although I think they're all sharing somewhat of a common base, and they're all very interesting. Um, check them out. They're, uh, they're, they should be relatively easy to find if you go to like the Discuss or the Reddit page um, or, or ask on IRC. Uh, so backing up a little bit, uh, we're going to move on to the operations things I was kind of hinting at. Um, right now, and this is totally understandable, Rust is somewhat of a young... <clears throat> excuse me, young ecosystem. And there's not a lot of people talking right now about tools that make it possible or easier or more sane uh, to run Rust apps in production uh, and run Rust apps for a long time. So things like collecting metrics, things like reporting those metrics, uh, things like tracing and debugging. The debugging story is pretty good. I mean, we have GDB and LDB and you can remote debug via that. But uh, these other things, there's basically no answer. Um, and I might be wrong. Um, if somebody knows of something or somebody wants to shout out uh, things in this area, please do that. But basically, there's a huge hole in the ecosystem right now. And if somebody wants to make an impact in the Rust community, the opportunity is there. Uh, and I would encourage you to do that. Um, so if you, know, if you need things to look at. There's great models in, in other uh, communities. Um, one, like for metrics, for instance, one I'm familiar with is there's a JVM library called uh, Metrics, I think. It's to, yeah, Code of Hell Metrics, um, which is pretty good. And if we had a Rust equivalent, that would be excellent. Um, reporting, you know, we need, we need connectors for Graphite and uh, I'm forgetting all, there, you know, there's 10 different uh, um, visualization and uh, metric collecting projects out there. Uh, tracing stuff, you know, you can go all the way from, actually, so the, the, the very coolest things going on in tracing as well as metrics are coming out of browsers. Um, so Firefox has some really excellent um, memory tracing things coming out of it. Servo has a project called Heap Size, I believe, that I'm very hopeful is going to grow and become kind of the standard go-to for 
this type of thing, at least for heap metrics. Um, Chrome, for instance, has a tracing dashboard that if you've never seen it, I encourage you to look at it. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, I don't know if Firefox has an equivalent. I should ask some of the experts here. But I know that Firefox's memory tra uh, tracing and tracking stuff is uh, equally as high quality. Um, yeah, so those are just some ideas of things that Rust currently has no kind of solution for. Um, and that are pretty critical when you're trying to go out and productionize uh, a distributed system. Uh, yeah, special thanks to everybody who's contributed to Rust, uh, to everybody who's contributed to Mayo, and uh, thanks to Andrew and the rest of the Raft crew. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, questions? All right. All right, Alex. Introduce yourself. Attempt to do this really fast. Um, so here's a, <clears throat> oh, well, there that goes. Hold on one sec. Uh, no, I gotta get my presenter notes and all that stuff too. I don't actually remember all this stuff. <clears throat> is there any way to, is this a mirror screen? So what's going on? Uh, it's, it is mirror. Um, it's cool. Yeah, okay. I'll just look it up from here. Let me just see, one sec. Yeah, so uh, I guess you guys can get a uh, an idea of what I'm going to present on from the, the picture here. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to do this without the speaker notes because I can't seem to to get it going. Let's see if this does it. Oh, cool. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience building a distributed system using Raft in a safe language. Uh, specifically, I built a, uh, I, we forked HBase a while ago and um, at my previous company and actually replaced the HDFS wall logging with a Raft-based model and a lot of cool stuff happened, learned a lot of stuff along the way. But I think the real idea here is we've covered, you know, what Raft is, um, the Raft project with Rust, the things that we need to make the Raft project with Rust a lot better. Um, I kind of want to come at it from the other direction and be like, here's some like another way you can kind of look at these technologies like Raft and some of the uh, advantages of using a language like Rust over, say, Java, which is a language that I had to do this in, and um, maybe some lessons that I learned uh, to do this better next time. Um, so yeah, as I said, you know, the the point of this talk is to first of all say that you know. Um, you know, this is actually like going to be a very big deal. Um, we can talk about, you know, what the purpose of something like Rust is as far as, you know, creating consensus across systems. Um, but the, the way to think of this is like, this talk is trying to talk about like uh, Raft implemented in a safe system as opposed to say uh, like Log Cabin and C++, which I'm sure Log Cabin is a shit and y'all should go help them build it. Um, and when you hear me, kind of harsh on specific architectural choices um, that could have been made, you should kind of frame them in the world of safe languages. Um, I would basically argue if you're architecting a system identically in C++ and Java, you're probably doing it wrong, at least when you're dealing with something that's gonna be like close to the persistence layer, i.e. close to syscalls. So um, please keep keep all of the, those criticisms in mind and they don't apply to any of the C++ stuff. So uh, really quickly, uh, Raft is, like I said, um, Diego d defined it for now, I'm just gonna simplify it to say it's a, a way to get a whole bunch of processes, whatever that means, to agree on stuff. Um, the obvious reasons why Raft is a good idea is, um, well, it's there's all the performance stuff. So um, compared to like 
other consensus-based systems, you don't have to do a lot of RPCs. In fact, people used to argue that it's a minimum number of RPCs. That's not really true, but for practicality it is. Um, but it also has this notion of kind of like passive replication as opposed to active replication. So there's actually this great paper I'll link in the back called like Viva La Difference, where they talk about the whole classes of consensus algorithms and how some are more passively replicated. Uh, like uh, arguably view stamp replication is more passively replicated than even Raft is um, versus an actively replicated system like a single decree Paxos system. So, um, you know, realistically, th there's lots of complicated ways to think about this, but the the important thing, you know, having, being at my, my previous job right before this, which was building a single decree Paxos based system, which is actively replicated versus using something like a passively replicated system versus Raft, what we're doing is we're, putting the data through a machine, seeing what the results are and replicating that rather than replicating all of the RPCs that are going to this machine and storing all of those RPCs in some type of uh, active record on each one of those machines. So generally when people build like a multi-master active active Paxo system, when you put an RPC into that consensus system, it's in memory on all those machines. And that actually makes sense because any of those machines can serve reads. In, um, or, or any of the most machines can take writes. Um, with Raft, the mutability, the mutation only happens on the master, and serving reads off the master is, you know, it's pretty limited when you actually do that. So, um, as a result, the overhead on each system is generally like one third versus like an active replicated system. Um, and frankly, it's way easier. Um, to implement like a Raft-based system than a single decree Paxos system. Having seen how these things are implemented and tested, I basically don't trust that anyone has actually ever done it right, period. Um, so another reason why Raft is um, like a lot better than Java is what Skeletor is pointing out. Um, being in the Java ghetto, like for building distributed systems is basically the worst thing in the world. Um, even if you ignore you know, the long GC pauses and just random pauses that Java makes, um, which will cause failure detection and recovery to be slow, and we can get to why that is a problem. Um, basically what a persistence layer is, is the thinnest wrapper around Unix system calls that you can make. That's literally what that thing at the bottom does. So if you have a language like Java, which can actually really make system calls in any reasonable way, you know, and you have to go through this high level of abstraction, now you have a high level abstraction making system calls in the thinnest thing you can make, which is not a good situation to be in. Um, so the, the, the real reason why, why Rust ends up like winning here versus all the other, those all system languages are the things that we're kind of all proud of. Not just the GC stuff, it's just you know what's going on under the hood. If we were to imagine this in like a language like JavaScript, um, or even a language like Go, arguably people could say, oh, I know what's going on in the hood, I can kind of trace what's going on. But you really can't, right? Like those Go libraries that are doing system calls, they're all unsafe. It's not a language set up to allow you to use those. You know, there's that unsafe keyword that's there. You know, Rust is fundamentally um, providing the right level of protection for those types of system calls um, while not getting in your way. Um, so for instance, like the Mio library that we're they were just talking about, it's really like a very thin layer around ePoll. So, okay, anyway, so that's kind of some high level stuff. Um, I wanted to get into like a real system. Um, so I'll tell you about the system I built and what we did. Um, but first to do that, I'm gonna have to tell you a little bit about HBase. Um, so this is what HBase's architecture looks like. The interesting thing is on the bottom, we have this HDFS thing, which is that Hadoop file system, and that's where all the data goes. And then we have the Zookeeper thing, which is another multi paxos based system similar to Raft. And that's where the HBase system stores kind of um, what the uh, state of the system is. So when a server goes down, it's Zookeeper that is used to alert the system that it has to do some type of cluster repair. Um, the other interesting thing about this slide is if you look at the three components in the read and server, HFile, memstore, and write-ahead log, we're going to quickly talk about this. Um, but basically, this, these are the main components of this HBase database and where data is stored. And basically, we have a write-ahead log that normally writes all of the RPCs coming into the database onto HDFS. Every once in a while, just like we were talking about with Rust, um, 
Oh, and sorry, it writes the write-ahead log and, and writes the entries to this in-memory store. Eventually, the mem store fills up, so we take a snapshot and write it to an H file, just like we snapshot in Raft. Um, actually, that's not really what that architecture looks like. This is normally what a Hadoop architecture looks like. Um, so if you, um, this is actually a Hadoop vendor bragging about how complicated the stack is. But the, um, the, if you look at this bottom portion down here, uh, with the file system and the NoSQL and the all that stuff. Um, I counted there's like something like 12 components, like 12 different daemons that you have to run to actually do that. Um, so we, our big goal was to kind of simplify that bottom layer because, um, well, besides Samuel L. Jackson would shoot me for a 12 component storage layer. Um, like I said, that thing that's responsible for getting your bytes onto disk should be kind of the minimum most manageable service that one really can make. Um, so that's basically everything we're going to talk about now is how we made HBase simpler using Raft to do that. Um, so one thing is, um, as we pointed out, there's this, so this is the data tracing through HBase. So you can see a client writes data to some cluster. It gets sent to one of the H region servers. Um, so a region is a portion of a table, so that region server figures out where the mutation should be applied to what region, and then that data gets written to a mem store, and then eventually this H log thing. So um, when the mem store gets full, it writes it out to a store file in HDFS. And we said, oh, well, that kind of sucks, because if I can't write to HDFS, then my server crashes. So we said, okay, well, let's just write these to local disk for now. We're already going to have to have local disk for wrapped anyway. And eventually we'll get it to HDFS, but we'll hide that from the user. Um, and then finally, this hlog thing, that write ahead log, which is normally general to HDFS, that's literally where our raft quorum went. This is where, like, instead of writing to a write ahead log, a region server would receive a write and write it to a set of raft cohorts. When the cohort said it was durable, it was just like written to a log. So that's the only architectural change that we made. Um, so basically, uh, the way to think about this is, um, the way, the way to think about this slide is the reason why I blame Diego is I blame him for being super awesome because what happened is, is people like me were able to kind of just throw raft there on the bottom and then I read through the raft of my raft paper and I said, oh, and this is the part where I do compaction, right? And then I go through raft compaction, but that's different than this notion of compaction up here where I was flushing the, the mem store to the H file and all of that type of stuff. Um, and what I eventually realized is, is this is, this is a important lesson when learning using raft is that when you first start using raft, it's really easy to kind of build your whole system around it and architect your code around Raft's notion of compactions, Raft's notion of snapshots. In fact, we even architected our code around Raft's notion of leader, not realizing that there's a big difference between a, a node thinking that it's a leader and a node actually being a leader, which is kind of a, an intricate thing to talk about here. But what we realized is that, let's see here. Let's see, I think I skipped a slide. There we go. Um, so what we realized here is that once that mem store has been flushed to the store file, all of the data in that raft log past that entry point no longer becomes an important thing to even care about. We're not like etcd where we want like a permanent lineage of what all the puts ever were. We only care about that final state of the database. So for us, what we were able to do is instead of building complicated membership logic to change membership, instead of focusing on how do we kind of take the in-memory state and snap it out, what we were trying to focus on is how do we write out, in essence, what is a columnar file and, and compact completely external from the Raft system itself. So our Raft implementation really didn't need membership changes. It also actually didn't really need any notion of compaction beyond truncation because it was handled externally by the system. And I don't know, it seems the, the proof still all can hold depending on how you do it. Um, so there's another thing. Um, when we first designed our system, we kind of designed it around Raft, and that was like the major thing. Um, and then someone was like, well, I think what we want to do is have multi-row transactions. And we know this works because Spanner did it. 
And how hard could that be? Google isn't that smart, you know. They, I don't know when did they did. And then when we, when I like read the paper the third time, and that's and ended up talking to some spanner engineers. What I realized is is that whenever they're doing anything complicated, it's all two-phase commit under the hood anyway. I don't know if you guys remember two-phase commit. Um, they make the big problem with two-phase commit is that there's some coordinator. He needs to be made reliable somehow. I think in Google's case, they then shove that reliability back onto their multi-paxo system, which we kind of think of like doing like Raft. But that's probably not the best way to do it. It's definitely the most expedient way to do it. Um, but the, the, the meta lesson here is that, you know, just like Raft, your system isn't Raft, it uses Raft. Even if your system heavily uses Raft to store data, it's probably not the end-all, be-all consensus algorithm for all time. Actually, two-phase commit is way better for a whole bunch of things. And I'm sure Diego would be glad to tell you how to integrate two-phase commit with Raft. Um, so that's that. Um, finally, moving forward. Um, <clears throat> so, oh yeah, there's one other thing. There's a database called Triode that uses something called mini transactions, which is probably worth checking out. Um, anyway. So uh, I actually think Skeletor is not overstating his case here. Um, almost all of the performance guarantee advantages we had over stock HBase um, had to do solely with our, our serialization and, and RPC story. Um, in fact, if I could give Dan's talk over again, uh, I probably would, because those concerns pretty much dominate everything, and we need way better abstractions here. Um, I've been trying to work on a library called Eventual. There's some stuff with coroutines. Um, the scary part about this is the story here in Java is way better than in Rust, which is actually quite surprising because we should be able to smash the hell out of any type of performance you get with Java. But the reality is if you like throw some netty and some like jetlang at some at code, you know, it's pretty easy to reason about what's going on. The code's not very difficult, and it'll go, you know, not at the theoretical speed of the hardware, but pretty close. Um, nonetheless, you know, I think, you know, even from basic calculations, as the size of the payloads as we have get smaller, our advantage should increase more and more. Um, but, I mean, I, overall, when building a distributed system, um, we really need to get these fundamentals right, and we need to make them a lot better. Um, one other thing that I wanted to talk about really quickly is basically all of operating system design, which means all of database architecture, is about to be thrown on its head. Um, so that's the other thing that we really need to think about. Basically, with non-volatile DIMMs and all this type of thing, which, which sounds like a non sequitur, but this is actually going to be core to how databases are designed, um, I, you should definitely check out the work in the Linux kernel around DAX and XIP. But basically, um, almost all contemporary databases in the last 15 years are designed around the page cache. If you look at like MongoDB and all these guys, they're basically leveraging MMAP for fun and profit. And that whole strategy of database architecture is going out of the window. And we need new answers there. So listen to the baby. Um, so on the last bit, um, you know, I, I just wanted to point out, you know, I've been kind of Quick, as quickly as I can, trying to cover these kind of huge topics. And what I, I think the overarching point of, of the of the talk is, is that it's these like these sharp edges and details that are going to dominate your system, right? So when you first start off developing a distributed system, you start drawing on a whiteboard and you draw boxes and you draw arrows to the boxes, and then eventually you're like, haha, perfect system, and you end up with something like like this, I guess. Um, but the reality of the situation is that really all that matters is, the, is the, the details of the implementation. Basically, distributed system architecture hasn't really changed in 30 years, but the details of, how, of what it takes to actually build reliable systems is so important that you know, you're going to end up like this Skeletor instead of the previous Skeletor unless you really think about you know, okay, I've got the architecture in my system. I've kind of drawn out in my head how all the code works. And then I really figure out in detail how it all fits together. Because, you know, if you just take 
like a RAF server and say, I cast RAF on my replicated state machine and now I have a, a, a reliable system, I don't think you're going to get ideal performance. That's not saying it's not an important tool. It's just that we need, we shouldn't, you know, RAF is creating a resurgence and a capability for us to use these tools, which is awesome, but we really need to um, understand them. And the real nice thing about RAF is that theoretically you can understand it or at least read some level of detail. And I think that's one of the reasons why I found it to be so important. Anyway, thanks for the rant. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much. Um, this was great. You all were amazing and uh, beautiful people. Thank you so much for speaking. Uh, I believe we have the space for a little bit, so feel free to hang out, have some more drinks, uh, mingle, talk. Uh, if you're on the internet, I'm sorry, but uh, hang out on Pound Rust. I, they're also amazing and beautiful people there, too. So uh, anyway, thank you so much for coming, and have a wonderful night. All right, good night. See you next time.